Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Roundtable. This is where we talk about different topics with our colleagues and our friends, all travel related. On this show, we're going to delve into some uh, funny topics, some actual serious topics that are quite, let's say, topical right now, um, and have a, a big announcement also as well. Um, so I want to start by uh, introducing Reed. If you haven't watched the program, the first two episodes, then uh, Reed has his insight tours. He has tours all over the world, but mostly not in Europe. Uh, and Reed wants to talk about uh, travel perspectives, uh, about how Americans and Europeans view individuals' rights differently. Um, and I, I kind of think about this a lot, and as an expat, I think I'm almost to the point where I don't, I don't even really know how Americans think anymore because I haven't been there in so long. I kind of think how I used to think as an American and now how I think a little bit differently as a European. But Reed, why don't you take us into this topic for today? All right, good morning or afternoon or evening, whatever it is for you, wherever you are. Um, also, I wanna introduce a little um, signature thing. Uh, over the years, as I've been traveling, I've started collecting a coffee mug from every country that I travel to. So every time we gather together here on Roundtable, I'm going to be having a different country cup. This is my lovely Greece coffee cup. It says, I love Greece on this side. So you can look forward to seeing a new coffee cup every time we gather here. All right, uh, travel perspective. Um, that's really the subject uh, that I wanna talk about is, is how travel gives us a completely new perspective about everything, about everything in life, about our own lives, about the countries we're visiting. Um, I, I think it's those of us who travel for a living have a, a special privilege of, of, of gaining a different perspective that's not really possible when you're uh, in the United States all the time. And Andrew, your comments fed right into that, right? You, there, there is a difference. There is a difference to the way we look at things and think about things. And yours has become, start to become more of a Eurocentric one than an, an American centric one. So that's really what I'm hoping to start in terms of a discussion with the group here is this idea of uh, the perspective we get from travel. Um, like I said, having been a professional uh, travel professional for uh, 25 years, um, I've had my, my feet in two different worlds. Uh, a perfect example of that is when I'm abroad, I try to watch Al Jazeera's English news broadcast just to get a, a, a more, you know, it's, it's certainly not an objective perspective, but it's not Fox News and it's not MSNBC that, that are so polarized and so partisan at home these days. So I, I get to have that fresh perspective, a different perspective um, wherever I go. And we're just able to observe life uh, in a different culture and, and people uh, addressing problems in different ways and, and, and managing things in different ways. And I, I think that's one of the great, great values uh, of travel. A um, couple of examples there. One of them is that I've over the years begun to identify or, or had confirmed for me that, that Americans are, are fearful. And by that, I mean, we're, we're fearful people compared to other people. That's the perspective that I've gotten from travel. Uh, I've, I've blogged about that. Uh, when the Guide Collective launches very soon, uh, it's, uh, uh, its website, my, my blog on culture of fear will be on there. And that's, that's one of the examples of what I'm talking about. Um, but the one I wanna examine a little more closely is the fact that, that Europeans and Americans are completely different about how we look at individual rights, right? In, in Europe, individual rights are important, but they're not sacred. Whereas in America, individual rights are, are the most important thing, right? Our personal liberties, our individual rights, they trump everything else. And, um, you know, this is, it, it's a very, very different way to look at, at life. In Europe, there is more of an emphasis on the needs of the community. And in America, it's always about the individual. Let me just throw out a couple of examples that I've been using for years on my tours. Uh, I'm probably the only one really old enough here to remember it, back in the 70s, the black forest started to die, right, from automobile uh, uh, emissions. 
And the German government moved very quickly to solve that problem. You know, they, they enacted all kinds of new regulations. The automobile companies had to abide by them. And boom, they, they, within a decade, they had reversed that and they saved the black forest from, from destruction. Can you imagine if in the United States, the government says, overnight said automobile manufacturers have to change A, B, C, and D, the, the, the caterwallering that would have exploded, you know, the, the, the NIMBY attitude, the, oh, we can't afford that. And it's, it's all about, you can't tell me what to do, right? It's not, it's, uh, there is a, a less of a willingness to see what the community needs and more emphasis on the individual. Um, Another, what really started me thinking about this was I used to always fly into Amsterdam. And as you fly down into Schiphol Airport, you fly over many, many Dutch communities. And there's a clear delineation on the edge of the town. And over 23 years of flying into that airport, it never changed. My point being, you could see that they had genuinely strong um, zoning laws about where you could build buildings and, and what land needed to be preserved for agriculture, right? Agriculture is really big in the Netherlands. So here's this, this graphic uh, uh, example of, of the difference. If you flew over the same town anywhere in America for 23 years, you would see sprawl, 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 because we can't tell Americans what to do and what not to do when it comes to uh, you know that sort of issue. So, Reed, Reed, just can I can I jump in, can I jump in here please. for a sec? Sure. Yeah, because like I mean, uh, fortunately, I'm not in the states right now, and but of course, I just see all the new stuff, and uh, obviously, this has a lot to do with people wanting to wear masks or not wanting to wear masks, and how that's so politicized. Over here, I think like if you look, pe people who aren't let's say social distancing or aren't doing mask things, it's not really a political thing. Sometimes it's like shit, I just want to go down to the, you know, to the discotheque or whatever, or I just want to go swimming with my friends, or I really don't want to cancel my 100 person wedding party, uh, or whatever. It's, it, it's kind of like, they're, they're doing it. They're like, if, if they're, if they're breaking these laws, it's not because, oh, I want to like, like, put out that I have these individual rights, and you can't take that away. And I don't have to wear a mask, and I'm not going to, it's more It's I think it's here, it's more of just like, Ah, oh, shoot! Like I'm, I, I want to have a, I want to have a fun time. I want to do something, but no one seems to back it up with this whole like, yeah, but it's my right not to wear a, a mask thing. And certainly, those people who do, it's not really on political lines because, as most of you know, in Europe, there's so many different political parties. It's not like there's, you know, uh, you know, chocolate or and vanilla, which is like in America, it's like you get choice A or you get choice B, and that's kind of what what most people rally around. So. It, it is interesting that here, like you, you definitely don't see if people if people act as similar as some Americans do. It's not for the same reasons, I would say. Well, you've you've actually taken me right to my conclusion. the The reason this was on my mind to choose as a topic is look at the issue of masks, right? I mean, uh, Europe has done much better with that, and and if you expand your observations to Asian cultures where uh, being in lockstep with the community is that's that's what's sacrosanct in their cultures, right? Is being part of the community, the family, the the ex extended group. Uh, that's much more important than than what any individual needs. And so you've got a place like Japan that's very very densely populated, but but they understood very early on that everybody needs to wear a mask, and their COVID uh, you know graph has gone down 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 uh, to zero. And so this issue of Americans needing, having this mythology about our individual rights uh, is, is having a real effect on what's going on in our culture right now. Right now it's the mask and then I'm almost done. And then if, um, you know, when, when we get, when we do get a vaccination, there's this whole movement of non-vaxxers that, that don't want to take that because they don't want anybody telling them what to do. So I'm done, jump in, give me your perspective. I just want to be the devil's advocate here a little bit because uh, having, you know, lived in a, a European slash American household my whole life and also spending a lot of time in Europe, 
I would say that while I absolutely think you're right, and right now we're getting real slapped by the individuality issue because nobody wants to wear a mask. Whereas even in Italy, where people really live to their own kind of you know, walk by their own beat, uh, they're all in with taking care of each other and community and wearing the masks to take care of each other. All that's true. But I would say the one observation I've made after all of my years of travel around the world is that the, the thing that differentiates Americans is that individual liberty culture, but that also is an incredibly creative fire in all of us. I don't think there's another culture on this earth that is as creative and motivated and constantly making new things and coming up with new ideas. And we're just a boiling pot of individual creative approaches to things. And it does come with a cost. I mean, the cost of that is that, yeah, you can't, you're not the boss of me, you're not my mom kind of attitude. But on the other hand, I, I see a real benefit uh, to our culture in that, in the just incredible diversity of perspectives and the, the just incredible creativity that our, our country generates. Yeah, sir, I would I would have to agree with that. I just look, it's like it's like every culture, or every country, it's like it's just like you got your pluses and minuses and kind of depends like how you know if you can take the certain minuses that come along with a place because the positives are are, are so great. Um, certainly, and that would be a topic for a, for for another show would be about kind of like self motivation and DIY and all this stuff, uh, initiative taking and things like that. That is definitely more ingrained in the, in American culture than than elsewhere. Although, like I would all, I always kind of say like for me, it's more of a native English type of, type of like characteristic because uh, with a lot of Australians I know, like I found them to be fairly similar to Americans in in the respect of like let's have let's let's kind of do our own thing let's be more creative but probably they don't take it to the extreme so like the issues now of people not wearing masks because of the individual rights um, you know they're not they don't go as far as we do on on things like that but as my dad always said you got to take the shit with the sugar and so it's one of those things I mean there's some amazing things in Slovenia the bureaucracy not being one of them, which will be a topic for another show, I think quite soon. Um, it's like, I got to put up with that because there's all these other things I really like here. And you know, it's like anything, there's not a, you know, there's not a perfect person and not a perfect match and not a perfect culture, not a perfect country. Um, and sometimes um, like with, the, with, with, with what's going on right now, it just seems like this is like the really downside to the whole individual, individual is individualism is key type of thing in the U.S. I'm going to chime in here uh, and just uh, make a little bit of a distinction here between um, politics and culture and explaining these differences between, you know, America and uh, let's say Europe. Um, you know, we're giving the Italians a lot of credit for their um, their handling of the COVID response, and their their numbers are way way down. They have a fraction of new cases now that they used to have uh, at the uh, peak of the pandemic for them, um, and so they've you know they're they're getting a lot of attention. There's a great article in New York Times by uh, Paul Krugman this past week. Um, sort of wishing you know America could have had a more Italian like response, but you know. I don't know so much if it comes down to individualism or even politics, um, because even this week, you know, Andrea Bocelli, for example, uh, he he came out this week and he showed up at a at a political party event and expressed uh, some you know some harsh criticism about the government lockdown in Italy, saying that it made him feel you know dehumanized and and humiliated to be forced sort of to be confined to his house. And, you know, that was, that was really unexpected because he had also done this Easter Sunday performance in Milan, right? That was broadcast around the nation. It was really part of a kind of unifying moment for rallying Italians around this cause. And then for him to come out now and express that opinion was sort of shocking for a lot of people and maybe even in the last day or so he's kind of walked those comments back a little bit but um in uh you know in italy it's, it's really hard to compare italians politically because they have so many distinct opinions about different topics that constantly are realigning with uh political parties of the moment and so that you know this is what, there isn't a one-party system like uh, or two-party system sorry as there is here 
I would go so far as to say that uh, specifically in Italy, and I suspect uh, for many other European countries as well, that uh, the, the COVID response really had more to do with culture than it did politics. Because of course the Italians also are notoriously, you know, not nationalistic. They're not cohesive at all about any sort of, um, you know, big national topics, except for soccer, famously. Uh, except on this one thing, you mean football. You know, with right. coronavirus, they were. And I think that the, the, the thing that explains it best to me is that the Italians have respect for their elders, you know, and, and respect for the vulnerable. And that is something that um, compared to the U.S., I don't think we quite have that same sort of level of care and empathy for, um, you know, for our, our, our seniors. Just yeah, well, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna wrap this up before we go, and then we'll get on to the next topic. Uh, and that was one point I wanted to bring up real quickly is, you know, it, it's not just even respect for the elders; it's also just like you know, elders are so more integrated in Europe to people's families and extended families, which is why I mean, where I live in Slovenia, it's like you hardly see any homeless people because people have these extended families to get help from or live with or or whatever. So like that kind of also affects people because you're like, oh. Yeah, like I actually see my grandma. I can see my grandma because she's like an hour away. So like, I don't want to do something that could cause her harm instead of like, oh, I see my grandma like every fifth Christmas or something like, like it is in the States. Um, so that's what I want to kind of end with with there. There's a lot of, a lot of discussions that, uh, and, and topics that we could take out of this and certainly delve into on another episode. I think we could all agree that would be a good thing. Um, I want to go, let's say, let's go from a little heavy to a little lighter topic, travel screw-ups. Um, now, I'll just admit that, you know, I'm still waiting for the day that I will show up to a hotel with my guests and, like, realize I booked the wrong dates and we don't have any rooms. Fortunately, that has not happened to me, uh, knock on wood. Um, so I'm going to be saying, hey, I'm exempt from this. Obviously, I'm exempt from this uh, topic here because I haven't had any travel screw-ups. <coughs> um, but uh, I think Sarah might have a, a few that she'd like to discuss. Well, I'm not gonna discuss my screw ups as a tour guide because I don't want y'all to lose faith in my abilities as a tour guide. There have been plenty of those and those that's maybe a different topic. Uh, but just in my own personal travels, there have been screw ups and some of them uh, were maybe not the best in the moment, but in retrospect, they make great stories. So I always think that a trip without a screw up is really not as delightful a story long-term as the trip that goes perfectly. But the one that came to mind immediately uh, was when I was traveling uh, in Eastern Europe uh, with a group of friends and actually friends that, that Andrew knows. Andrew and I've been friends for like 30 years. So these are people that we used to always travel in Eastern Europe with. And uh, I was masterminding the expedition, the first expedition into Slovenia. So a group of us had left Prague and we were heading into Slovenia. And I decided, I don't know why, I think we'd taken a late train and the train was due to arrive in Ljubljana at like two or three in the morning. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Let's stop on the Hungarian border and just stay for the night. So I looked at a map because in the olden days we didn't have phones to actually investigate destinations. I just looked on the map and there was a village on the Hungarian border. And I thought, oh, okay, we'll just stay in that village for the night. In the morning, we'll catch the next train into Ljubljana, and that way we actually can sleep in a bed for the night rather than uh, sleeping on the train and then getting up and you know arriving in a city in the middle of the night. So we all get off the train and we arrive in what is not a town, what is just a train station, and that's it. And there's a bar, we can see a bar, and that's pretty much it. And of course, I don't speak Hungarian. Oddly enough, one of my travel companions did speak some Hungarian because he's kind of an eclectic person that took like a summer course in Hungarian. So we were lucky enough that he was able to talk to the people in the station. There was like one or two people in the station. They sent us to the bar. We tried to talk to the bar and explain our situation that a group of us had gotten off the train and we were stranded and we had no idea where to sleep. And after a while, eventually they understood and they let us sleep in the train conductor's lodge which was the only other building at that place. It was a bar, it was the train station, and then it was like a hotel for Hungarian train conductors where they slept so they could head back uh, to Budapest. So yeah, so we slept there. We went and slept there and it was, I would say, the creepiest hotel 
I have ever, it wasn't a hotel, but it was the creepiest place I've ever slept. Just like think about a gulag movie where there's like, you know, communist block housing and the buzzing fluorescent lights. And there was bathrooms down the hall and the bathrooms were just slightly a cut above a pit toilet. And yeah, uh, it was one of the, I think it was probably the worst accommodations I've ever slept in maybe. Uh, but in the morning we got the train and we headed into Ljubljana and it was fine. At the time it seemed like one of the worst screw ups I've ever made, but 20, 30 years down the road, everybody that was involved in that incident still laughs about it. So was it a screw up? Yeah, I'm gonna give myself a pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think almost any screw up, unless it's like I actually missed my flight and I never got to go on whatever travel vacation I was gonna go on, is always is always fun because whatever whatever crap happens to you then that you're like cursing yourself and mumbling and you know shaking your fists at, it's like, it's gonna like be 10 times better as a story uh later on because when everything goes perfect you know it's like your the best travel stories are usually like i met this really interesting person or a bunch of weird stuff went wrong but then it it turned out uh, beautifully uh like like it does so often in travel reed would you have any uh any uh little little screw ups or things that went sideways on you there's no way no. he he never has screwed up i bet <laughs> never right <laughs> That's what that's what uh, I hear. The note, you note silver, you uh, silver in, tongue in flatterer, you Sarah. Um, oh gosh, I'm I'm not afraid to to show my fleet feet of clay. Um, I I can't think of any really disastrous moments, but I I 15 or 18 years ago, I had a group in the Cinque Terre, and I I'd been going in and out of there regularly for several seasons, multiple times. Uh, I didn't check the train schedule. I just you know, I knew there was going to be an 837 train. And so I put that all up on the schedule for our departure day. And, um, and of course, as you all know, right, uh, the tour members are always super nervous and early. And so they, they're all, they've all gone to the train station by the time I come out of the hotel and walk leisurely to the station. When I arrive on the platform, there's a train right there. And, there, and everybody's looking at me all wide eyed, like, should we try to jump on this train? I said, no, no, there's another one in 10 minutes, you know. So the train doors close and off it goes. No, the train schedule had changed from summer to fall, as you all know that that happens. Um, and there was not going to be another train for two hours. So there we are on the platform with my whole group. Uh, and, and it's entirely on me. I, there's, there's no way I can sort of deflect blame when I show up last on the platform and tell everybody, no, don't get on the train that's standing there. So that was a pretty tough moment as a guide, I have to say. Um, I, and I had a personal story that's not completely dissimilar from yours, Sarah. Um, uh, the first time I was in Europe in 1978, I was traveling with three other people. We'd been in Germany for six months. We were used to the German trains, trains going everywhere 10 times a day on schedule. And we um, were traveling down to Greece on our rail passes. We got on a night train from Munich um, and we had this brilliant idea that we, we wanted to get down and see the, um, the Adriatic coast, right? We wanted to zip down to, um, to, to Dubrovnik and split and, uh, and, and see that coastline, the, Dal the Dalmatian coastline. And um, so we just, just, and by the way, uh, you know, for, for you younger people watching this, like Sarah said, this is before smartphones and online schedules and stuff, unless you were traveling with a 10 pound Thomas Cook train schedule book, you kind of had to wing it when it came to train connections. So we got off the, overnight on the train from, from Munich, we got off the train in Be in Belgrade. No, sorry, Zagreb, Zagreb. And this was still Yugoslavia back in 1978. We got off the train in Zagreb and it was a lot like you described, Sarah. The, there was a city there, but it was like grim, grim, grim in 1978. And we got off expecting that, you know, within half an hour, there would be a train down to the coast and, and that we'd be able to go down to the coast and do the, all of our stuff and come back and catch the ongoing train at the end of the day. No, <laughs> there was one train to the coast and we had just missed it. And not only that, so we thought, okay, well, we'll just jump on the next train going on down to Athens. No, that's 14 hours away. So here we are stuck in Zagreb, Yugoslavia, which I understand is, has gotten to be quite nice now. Oh, it's, it's, but... it's, it's very, I would call it under, underrated actually. Def yeah. Definitely, definitely not. It's more, but let's say not as grim and black and white 
and monochromatic yeah, it, as it was back then. But it was absolutely a, a Cold War stereotype in 1978. And we, we went and found a park. We hadn't slept well. I'm sleeping on the grass and I wake up with a rifle in my face, you know, and there's some communist police, military, I don't know what, trying to talk to me in, in some Slavic language. And I, I got the message, right, to get off the, the grass. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll never forget that experience of just getting off a train naively thinking that, well, it's going to be just like Germany and Switzerland in terms of uh, rail connections and our ability to do what we want to do. So those yeah, are my you know, two for today. I, you know, we, can do I, this, we can keep going on this. Oh, yeah, we can revisit this topic. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in some ways, like, it is actually harder now with all the technology and all the everything to like kind of do these kind of general screw ups or, oh, I didn't know I needed a visa to come into your country or whatever. I mean, there's something to be kind of nostalgia about of like, oh yeah, it was a little bit more like wild back then of uh, whatever, but everyone's, you know, still alive here and survived. So I guess it didn't work out too badly. Reiner, do I think you that would be it. I was just gonna say, I think that would be a great topic for us to explore more is the difference between traveling in the 70s, 80s, 90s than it is now. And the other topic that just kind of comes to mind I'd love to discuss is what was the Eastern Bloc like in the 90s? Because <laughs> that is a really interesting topic. It was grim. Grim is a great word. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Rainer. Well, I'll pick up on that because uh, my, my uh, travel screw up memory comes from the mid 90s. Um, I was in college and uh, I ended up s sleeping out in the middle of the desert uh, somewhere in Arizona um, because a buddy and I had been hitchhiking from LA to the Grand Canyon and we got a ride from these truckers. And uh, the truckers, you know, halfway out into the desert, they said, uh, well, you guys uh, got any weed? And uh, we were like, no, um, we don't. And uh, so then they were like, maybe, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, they're like, well, we're turning off here. We're going south. You guys need to keep going, you know, east. So uh, we'll drop you here. And it was out at this interchange, literally in the middle of the desert, nothing around. So they pull over, we jump out, and there we are on the, uh, on the interstate um, and didn't get a ride for the rest of the day. So we ended up sleeping out in the middle of the desert. Uh, you know, coyotes howling, right? You can just imagine. Uh, we made it through, and the next morning we got a ride, and off we went. Um, but uh, that seems like an ill-advised uh, travel recommendation to go hitchhiking to the Grand Canyon. Now in 2020, in the middle of the 1990s, after reading Jack Kerouac, it sounded like a fantastic idea. And it ended up being a great memory. Um, but in general, I'll say this, since then, and since you know, working, uh, leading tours, uh, I'm a firm believer that there are no mistakes in travel, that there are just new opportunities. So some of the best travel experiences come when things go wrong. And so I almost kind of eagerly uh, look forward to those moments when, when you have to improvise and be spontaneous. And then that's when the magic happens. Well, I speaking of, we're before. talking about some nine, 90s uh, things and all these experience we've had quite some time ago. Um, one of the things that's, that, that's on my mind, especially when I read old travel books when countries were different or borders were different or just history in travel of things that are like, wow, this, this would have been amazing. And then you realize it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I wanted to bring in um, to, to, for a topic here and we'll, we'll start with, with Reiner in just a second is my idea is always like, shoot, if I had, a like I always say, if I had a time machine, I would never go in it because I wouldn't want to go back and screw anything up and not be in the position where I am right now except for 2020, which I probably might want to go back in time just to stock up on certain things. But, but I would like to go back in a time machine to go see some different things like that you just can't, can't see anymore. Um, and that's where I, we, we'll start the topic uh, with, with that. And Reiner, if you have some, some thoughts, we'll take you back to where would you want to go and what would you want to see that you can't actually see anymore or visit anymore? Love the sound effects there. So much better than the sirens. Just, just for you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so lots of, uh, lots of thoughts come to mind here. Uh, I would love to have seen Pompeii, you know, before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. I would have loved to walk, you know, through the splendid streets and, and to see all those villas, um, temples, uh, to see this sort of luxurious seaside city in ancient Roman times would have been 
it would have been uh, quite something. I also would have loved to have seen Mount Vesuvius as a fully complete cone. You know, today when you look at the profile of the mountain, it has sort of half, its top half has been blown off. Um, and uh, uh, I understand, you know, back then before that eruption in the first century, it was a, a fully formed cone. So it would have been twice as high hovering over the city of Pompeii. That would have been pretty spectacular. Um, I would have loved to see the Ponte Vecchio in um, Florence before the uh, Medici had the bridge rebuilt and, and added uh, jeweler shops to it. I would have loved to see it as a working bridge, but also, um, you know, the, the butcher stalls where the butchers were butchering animals and throwing the detritus, you know, over the edge of the bridge down into the river to poison the waters for the Pisans uh, at the mouth of the Arno River. Um, and I would have really loved to have traveled in 1851 to London during the World's Fair. In fact, all of the World's Fairs of the 1800s would have been spectacular sights to see. In, uh, in London in Hyde Park, 1851, um, there was the Crystal Palace. It's this incredible work of architecture built at the time of you know, wrought iron and glass, the new materials of the industrial age. And the Crystal Palace was this huge gallery, this, this steel and glass gallery it was 1800 feet long Consider that the largest cruise ships these days are about a thousand feet long. So this is, you know, almost double the size of the biggest cruise ship you can imagine. Uh, you know, 150 feet tall or something, and uh, a fully formed, barrel vaulted, glass enclosed building. It was sort of the precursor for a lot of the gallerias that you see, uh, you know, in Milan and Naples, uh, Paris, uh, for example. And to be able to walk inside of this Crystal Palace, you know, in the mid 1800s with these brand new cutting edge technology materials would have just been spectacular for a person at the time who was used to seeing architecture composed of bricks and, and stone masonry blocks and, uh, you know, wood timber. So um, I kind of imagine it being like walking inside of a diamond, if you could imagine what that would be like. Would have loved to see that. Would have loved to have been in Chicago uh, for, you know, the 18, I think it was 93 World's Fair with the Ferris wheel. Would have loved to see Paris in 1889 with the uh, Eiffel Tower for the first time. Just the, the spectacles of the 1800s World's Fairs. What Damn, do you All right, you got, you, got your, you got your dates all down there. Uh, I'll go around and get everyone else's like picks uh, for that. I just want to throw in I think I think the, the biggest thing unless we're only going back like maybe 100 years I think the biggest thing in a, going back in time would just be the smell I think that would be the hardest thing to 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 to, to get over I mean that would be like oh the time machine worked because my god it would just I think I would be totally shockingly happy if it smelled semi-normal but that would be my only like kind of worry about going to some of these places although I guess maybe in Roman times it, they kind of figured that out a little bit um Reed, you got any any place, any particular thing you would want to go see that you can't really see anymore? Um, yeah, I was I was thinking a little bit more contemporary than than Reiner was. Things that uh, uh, have sort of disappeared off the traveler's map in our own lifetimes. Um, I, I remember when I was about in my early twenties and starting to travel, hearing about uh, Syria and Iraq and Iran. So. I would say I, you know, and, and those places are, I mean, Syria is clearly not a place you want to go right now. Um, I think Iraq and Iran are not completely off limits, but, you know, it would be uh, a challenge to one's uh, mental toughness to travel to those places and feel safe. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking the the parts of the Middle East in general that have some amazing things to see and do that I'm not really comfortable to go and see right now. So that, that was the first thing that I thought of. But just while Reiner was talking, I thought of a, a, a small specific thing. And, and this would, the time machine concept is really important because I would like to take my American sensibilities back with me. Um, I, would, I would love to go back 800 years to when they just finished Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. And that, uh, that big square out front that, that you now you can stand at the back and, you, and you're 200 yards away and you, you see the entirety 
of the facade of Notre Dame. Uh, we all know as, as tour guides that, that the buildings used to come up to about 30 feet in front of Notre Dame and that you could not see the entirety of the, of the facade until you got right there. And then it was just boom, right in front of you. You can put yourself in that mindset by standing there and reminding yourself of that. But I would just like to have wandered through those, those medieval streets that would represent what is today that wide open square and then boom, burst out and, and, and just see from very, very close up that facade of, of Notre Dame. You know, one thing that I would, that it just kind of came to my mind because I'm a big uh, film guy. I would, I would love to go Roman times, Colosseum, see a gladiator fight and just sit there with my little DVD player and be like, all right, here's gladiator the movie. Like, let's see, like, let's check it out. Like, what did it get right? You know, what is, you know, is it, I'm guessing it would be far more chaotic and far more gruesome and far, far more like totally bizarre to sit through you know, what you think is going on there than what you see in these movies. But I would kind of just like to see like, you know, like we, it's maybe we, I don't know if we can really imagine it unless we were there to see what kind of like spectacle it, it would have been. So that, that'd be one thing I'd like to check out. Sarah, I'm guessing you probably have something in Italy that you want to go see? Well, a, a few different things, actually. I mean, if I were to get a time machine right now, I would immediately go to ancient Rome. That would be for sure be my first thing because Rome is sort of where my passion for art and architecture started. And it's the thing that I've studied the longest. So ancient Rome would be number one. The time period would be t tough to choose. Uh, I think maybe the end of the reign of Augustus, but then again, you miss a bunch of uh, things from the time of Hadrian. So I might go at the end of the reign of Hadrian, which is second uh, century BC or AD. Um, like let, let's say 150 would have been a great time to go because then you can see the accumulation of some of the best years of the Roman empire. I don't think I would have wanted to be there at the end, like the 300s would have been kind of, mm. so that would be fantastic. Um, but I think I also on that list, uh, one of the first things that came to mind for me also like Reiner was the World's Fair of 1889 uh, because I talk a lot about that. I've read a lot of books and it's such an interesting um, thing because a lot of people don't know the great spectacle of the World's Fair of 1889 was actually the cowboy show from the United States. So it was cowboys and Indians. They brought all these people in because this was, you had to bring in the great wonder from your country. And so the United States was represented by a Wild West show. And that's one of those interesting things I wish I would have been there to see because what a funny little like um, it's a strange dichotomy. Um, and then another thing that comes to mind immediately for me is that I have a great passion for Cambodia and for uh, the Khmer culture. And uh, it's one of the most impressive sites I've ever seen to go to Angkor Wat and to all of the surrounding temples. Um, but I, what I understand about it that most people don't, I think, know is that the Khmers were powerful and enormous in the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. And we just don't know a lot about them in the Western world. Um, so I would love to see uh, Angkor Wat at kind of the height, and not just Angkor Wat, but the whole Khmer civilization uh, at about their height, which would have been the 1500s, around the, the time of the Italian Renaissance. That would have been interesting because I can kind of imagine what life was like during the Italian Renaissance. We have a lot of paintings, we have a lot of descriptions, uh, but the Khmer culture, we just don't have enough to really know. And I'd love that just to understand a broader perspective of what world culture was like during a time period that I feel like I've pretty studied pretty well. I, we have a blind spot in American culture to really just looking at European connections, but those Far East connections too are also fascinating. So those would be my probably top picks. Oh, and I, I'd also like to go back to about 1950, 60, and meet my, uh, my grandparents. I'd love to have met my, uh, my dad's dad. And I'd love to have met uh, Grandma Bobin, who was my mom's grandmother, who is like apparently legendarily one of the funnest women in our family. She was about four foot 10. Uh, she drank a shot of whiskey before bed every night. She loved to make donuts and she loved to ride roller coasters. So She's kind of like my, my uh, ancestral spirit animal. So I'd love to go back and have met her. So she was like four foot 10. And then you some, somehow in that whatever, 30, 40 year span, you got up to like six, three or something. So I'm not exactly sure how that worked out. Yep, <laughs> genetics. <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna have a little, uh, a little breaking news, I think.
Is it time for some breaking news? Can we can we break something? Sarah, is there anything newsworthy that we should be talking about right now for this episode? Well, yes, my friend, there is something very exciting that all four of us are uh, are apprised of, uh, and we want to introduce to everybody who's watching and everybody you know. Uh, so about a year ago, I kind of had an idea. I don't know if it came to me in a dream or where the idea came from, but it came to me that wouldn't it be great if we figured out a way to collaborate with all of these incredible people that we know, because not just myself, but all of us, we know so many interesting local guides. We know so many interesting other co colleagues like ourselves, tour guides. Wouldn't it be amazing if we all work together to create something uh, to elevate the dialogue in travel because you know I think the internet is full of like top 10 lists of the top 10 best places to go or this bucket list travel idea which I think is so gross um, how can we have conversations about travel that are more in depth and more nuanced and how can we draw upon all of the people that we know to create a broader dialogue you know I have really appreciated having adventures with Sarah but adventures with Sarah is limited because it's with Sarah and I would, I love the idea that I'm starting to draw all of you guys in, but what I wanted to do was to create something that wasn't just me, that was something that was all of us. So we don't talk about, you know, the individual in travel, we talk about all of our combined experiences and all of the different points of view that, that we have. Uh, so drawing on that idea, uh, when the pandemic hit, I finally wrote down this idea and I pitched it uh, to everybody. And that is the idea, we're calling it the Guide Collective. And uh, we are going to be launching the Guide Collective this week, probably Monday, we're going to launch the website. Uh, and the idea is going to be that we, are, we have created a travel magazine that draws on the perspectives of about 20 different colleagues from countries, different countries all over Europe and all over the world. Uh, we're gonna expand it out to people who are in Africa and Asia, people that we know, we have contacts everywhere. So the eventual, eventual idea is that every month we'll have a theme and then each of the members will write a piece, an article about that particular theme so that we get completely different perspectives on a topic. So the, our first launch of an idea is bread. That's the topic that we were all given as a writing prompt. And everybody involved in the Guide Collective has produced a piece of writing just based on that. No other information. We didn't give them any other direction. Uh, some people took it in personal story directions. Some people wrote about a kind of bread that they really like. Uh, and what we're going to do is every month have a different topic. Uh, September's subject is going to be democracy. And how do we from all of these different countries see democracy? And along with that, Andrew has taken on a fun little angle on the, the travel writing piece. Do you want to tell him about what you're coordinating? Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I I have kind of my like, things that fit in little categories, like, uh, I, okay, I love food, obviously. So, you know, oh, hey, these are all these kind of dumpling shaped things that people should try. They might not heard about, oh, I'll do like my five favorite dumplings to get, or, you know, here's these scenic churches or, or beautiful drives or, or whatever, any kind of category for, for travel um, that, that, that I can lend my voice to like, hey, don't miss out on these things, or here's something you should check out. And I always try to pick on some things that are not so obvious. Um, and, and I'm going to allow everyone in the guide collective to kind of put their two cents in. So we might have a 10 guides each pick their like favorite craft beer from the country they're living in, things like that. Just there, it's more bite size, but it's a lot, but it's, but it is in depth because we're trying, I'm trying to shine light on a bunch of places and experiences and sites and food and things like that. Um, that's kind of an easy to read thing and that a lot of them will have links out to different to, dip, to, to more information or things like that. So uh, it's called GC Faves, Guide Collective Faves. Um, uh, that'll be up on the, on the new site. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the pieces uh, actually that I, that's gonna be when we launch is uh, on scenic drives. Um, I put down some of the, my favorite scenic drives I've done. And that almost, that was gonna kind of tie in with the uh, time machine thing. Because one of the places I went to um, that doesn't really exist anymore is this Crimea region, which Russia annexed. So um, if you're interested, hey, what was this place like before? Like, like when I could still go there, uh, you could find that and a whole host of other really interesting little kind of bite-sized things with uh, different perspectives from all the different uh, guides who are writing for this. So GC Faves, that's the section I'm kind of in charge of, let's say. 
And Reiner, you are our web designer and you're coordinating all of the different aspects of this project together. Do you want to tell them about some of the other pieces of this puzzle that we're putting together? Uh, yeah, so uh, I've been uh, assembling the website and um, we've got the uh, magazine, as Sarah described. Um, it's got various categories uh, within it. That'll be uh, interesting. We've got um, a GCTV page that um, is kind of a collection of all of the different video endeavors that um, members have been putting together over the years. We've got um, a virtual tour page. Guides are starting to put together virtual tour efforts. So uh, there'll be information on uh, those guides that are offering you know, a chance to connect with them through Zoom or Facebook Live, some sort of um, uh, online medium like that, that uh, allows them to, uh, you know, present different topics and then also engage in dialogue with people. So that's pretty cool. Um, we've got a calendar of events. Um, we've got some other stuff in there as well. And uh, it, it's cool. It's going to be a kind of hub, a sort of network of different guides from all over the world. Um, it'll be rich with content. And um, yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Check it out. It'll be pretty cool. And Reed, uh, you are one of our collaborating tour guides, and um, you're going to be putting your tours up there onto the website, right? So that people could know what dates and what kind of tours you're going to be offering. Is that right? Yeah, you know, that's that's one of the things that'll be part of the website, of course, is, is whatever endeavors all of our colleagues have going. I, of course, have imprint tours. Um, so there'll be a, <clears throat> a links page there for every anybody who finds out about me uh, and they can link then to imprint tours and, and see what's going on. So yeah, all my tours are gonna be listed. I've contributed quite a bit of content uh, to the first edition and, and looking forward to contributing in an ongoing basis. Fantastic, yeah, so that we have on board, uh, other than the people you see here, Trish Feaster, the Travel File, she uh, is actually taking the day off of Guide Roundtable because she is uh, putting the finishing touches as she's our editor in chief. Uh, as I said, Reiner is our um, web designer. Uh, Charlie Rawson from uh, England, she is our uh, branding and marketing expert. Uh, I am the founder and the uh, social media person and the herder of cats. Uh, Andrew is going to be in charge of faves as well as guides roundtable. Um, and we have Lisa Anderson on board, who is one of our editors, uh, and a whole host of other people that you probably know and you probably traveled with before. Uh, and there's at this point, there's about 20 of us, and uh, I hope that it's going to continue to grow as it launches and people start to follow it. So on Monday, I'm going to send out on this page on Adventures with Sarah all the contact information, and you can go and you can check out our first issue of uh, Guide Collective magazine, uh, along with some of the exclusive video. There's going to be a lot of content on there that's not going be available on Adventures with Sarah and eventually we will move this round table over to our new uh, Facebook page which will be exclusive to Guides Collective. So we'll probably do the round table one more time on Adventures with Sarah and then we're going to move it uh, over to the Guide Collective. So in this way my hope is that all of you who are watching there's about 35,000 of you that follow me and I would love all 35,000 of you to go ahead and uh, start following Guide Collective as well because I've had so much fun over the past three or four months since this pandemic hit, introducing you through interviews and tours, all of my friends and people that I care about because they are so interesting and they're all over the world, but they're all doing things and I want you to know about those things. So you're gonna learn about walking tours, you're gonna learn about classes, you're gonna learn about live tours once we're able to travel again. And I really hope in this way, I can connect this community to the communities of all of my, my colleagues. And then they have their own communities and they can connect back. So it's a dialogue. I hope that's what this represents is it's going to be a, expanding the dialogue and making a deeper conversation about what travel can be the potential. So did I cover it all you guys? Did I express it well? I, I, yeah. Absolutely. Hold on. <laughs> I, I would say one more thing and that's just that right now in the time of the pandemic when none of us is really traveling much at all, the, the Guide Collective will be a great resource for all kinds of vicarious travel and at least, you know, stimulating your travel imagination uh, in a vicarious way, in a, in a, uh, a virtual way. Yeah, 
yeah, so we'll have virtual classes, virtual tours. Uh, we're kind of working on our programming for that. So starting in August, you'll be able to travel virtually with a whole host of people who have at least, most of us have uh, formerly been Rick Steves tour guides. Uh, some of us are new, the people that are not connected directly with Rick Steves, but uh, there, you'll have the opportunity to travel vicariously with us. And just from the own comfort of your home, you can explore the world with us. So that's our goal. Any other thoughts or comments? Did I miss anything, you guys? I, I will just I will just say that as as when when Sarah told me about this idea and I saw everyone every, all the contributions and who was on board, I was like, okay, it's not another blog with someone who just spent thirty two hours in my country and wants to tell everyone like the thirteen best things to do because they spent a whole freaking day in Slovenia, which I can't stand. And this looks amazing because it's 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 not that. It's something, it's like, it's something deeper and it's from people who are living in different places. So um, it's not just another travel blog because, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of content out there um, and this is something we want to stand above. I mean, that's why we're doing shows like this and, and Sarah's doing her for uh, kitchen shows and other th things like that. It's, uh, we, we, want, we want this to be special, for sure. Right. Yeah. I would add on top of that, um, that uh, to Andrew's point, you know, th there's a lot of experience in this group. I mean, we're talking professional travel experience, people who travel for a living, um, decades of travel experience. I mean, it, I, added across the whole group, it must be centuries of travel experience. So um, it's really, I think uh, I think I hope it'll be kind of a travel authority or a go-to authority on on recommendations. And yeah, a lot of people are asking, you know, me and I know all of my colleagues as well. You know, when are you going to start, you know, offering your own private tours? Uh, that's obviously um, you know a, a, a big goal of ours, like as it has been with Reed. Um, so there will be a, a page on the website uh, that will list everybody's tour offerings. Many of them are still in the works because people are sort of um, rebuilding their business with post pandemic uh, ideas in mind. And that's really exciting. There's a lot of uh, creativity that's coming out of that based on, you know, all of these decades and centuries of experience that this group has. And so that's really exciting. Look for that to evolve in the coming months as people put together uh, itineraries for 2021 and even 2022 at this point. Yep, so this is the idea is uh, one one voice is great, but consider if consider that if you like following me, there are 20 of me. <laughs> they just don't all have websites. So this is a way for us to combine all of our enthusiasm and our knowledge and our expertise. And I really think that it is a very exciting opportunity for us to kind of create something new uh, using all of these incredible, experienced, intellectual, thinkers. I mean, we have some just amazing people on board. So I uh, look forward to that, you guys. So that's going to be Monday. We're going to launch on Monday uh, our initial episode, which your issue, which is going to be um, bread, but also we'll have the faves and we'll have uh, some other kinds of programming. Uh, and I think it's going to be really exciting. So also, if you follow any of the guides who are a part of the Guide Collective, they will be letting you know that on their Facebook pages. Uh, so once I put all that information out on Monday, please be sure to follow us on all of the social media platforms. We're going to have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then of course, uh, subscribe to the blog once it's live. So there you go. That's the big surprise. That's what I've been working busily on uh, with my friends, with all of these colleagues uh, since what, April, I think we've been working together. So uh, it's going to be a big deal. Okay. Right? So it's going to, it's going to be a huge deal. So uh, for, for, but before we skedaddle out of here, um, let's, let's go around. We'll start with Reed. Uh, something that's actually going to be part of the, uh, the New Guide Collective site, which, which Sarah and I mentioned, is the, is the fave. So our topic for today's roundtable is, since we're all not traveling much the rest of this year, Reed, what is the, what is the food? What is the dish that you're going to miss because you're stuck at home and can't travel this year. What's that one thing you just wish you had like a table or a bowl full of to dive into right now? Well, I think I'm probably um, the least foodie amongst everybody on the screen right now. And uh, food is not that big a deal for me, but of course food is a big part of travel. But I'm, I'm gonna hedge a little bit and instead of addressing a specific dish, I'm gonna say, and Sarah will understand this, anything, from Vietnam. 
Vietnam was the country of all that I visited that had the most diversity and the richness of flavors and every day was a culinary adventure there. So I'm gonna say blanket wise, um, what I'm missing is any lunch, any dinner, any breakfast in Vietnam. And I think we're signing off at this point. So I'm gonna say uh, happy travels, everybody. Keep traveling and travel with intent. Thank you. Reiner, what's your, what's, your, what's your thing that you're gonna like go crazy on when you get there next year? Oh man, what I'm thinking about right now, uh, it's summertime, it's hot, and I am uh, really missing a Sicilian granita. You know, just uh, the, the intensity of the flavor is not something that you can replicate easily outside of Sicily. And uh, boy, it just, it's so cold and so energetic and flavorful that it just like goes right to your brain. I love it. Um, so I'll be looking forward to one of those. Um, yeah, for me, you know, there's no mistakes in travel. There's just new opportunities. Sarah? That's a really tough one. The first thing that came to mind, Andrew, actually, Granita was one of them, but I am going to hopefully be in Sicily uh, within the next couple of months. But the one thing that I'm missing, Andrew, is having Frico with you in Frico. Chividale. Frico. We love our Frico. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm freaking out. Sacrifices to the gods of Frico. Frico on? We I'm are going to get. Freaking man. Where's yeah, my Frico? Frico? Yeah. Ah, oh, Frico. <laughs> everyone, need, everyone needs to learn about Frico, and they and they will when they read the guide, guide collective and when they go on our Sarah and I's Veneto Slovenia tour. Yeah, yeah, so I have to wait until April for our Veneto and Slovenia tour, which by the way is on you guys. That's in April and that's definitely on Veneto and Slovenia. Early May. And you can, early, 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 May. early May. Oh, sorry, early May. Early May. And so you can you eat know, all the melted cheese that you want. We'll, we'll take you to have, have the free code. I do have a question from the viewers online. They want to know what time on Monday are we going to launch the Guide Collective? <laughs> uh, so what we'll do is we will launch it right after Monday morning coffee chat. So that's going to be at uh, 11 o'clock. And hey, Ryder, I'm just going to put you on the spot here. Do you want to be my guest on Monday for Monday morning coffee chat? You're the only one I haven't had on yet. Sure, let's do it. All right. What do I got going Monday? Monday's all right. Yeah, Monday should should work. So since he's our web designer, uh, I think it's it's only right that he should be the one to go ahead and do the official launch of uh, the Guide Collective on Monday at 11 a.m. That's when we're going to launch the website. We'll give you the address and we'll let you go explore uh, there. So uh, what I had to say about all this is Antiamo. Let's go. Hmm? Let's 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 do this. Uh, uh, my, my pick is very similar to Sarah's because who doesn't love something with lots of melted cheese in it. So um, I'm going Hachapuri, which is a Georgian uh, cheese bread that just oddly enough, one of our contributors, Guide Collective Ben Curtis wrote a nice piece on. So on Monday, if you're like Hachapuri, what the hell is that? It's like, well, everyone who goes to Georgia knows what it is and you could read about it too in, uh, in the new Guide Collective. So. Um, with that, I will say, tell everyone, have fun storming the castle and have a great weekend. And um, we'll hopefully see everyone on our site, on our social media on Monday when we launch. Sound good? Awesome. All right, everyone. Take care. Peace out. Bye. Ciao.